All right, welcome back to another vid, Friday Brew. I think this is number nine, could be eight, could be 10, not keeping count, but yeah, we're doing pretty well. So two weeks later, back on track on a Friday, or depending on when you're watching it, I guess. But um, yeah, got the brew ready, been drinking it a little bit, hence why there's the, uh, the ring around it and a little bit left. It's a little bit cold, but it's fine. Even cold tea is fine. So yeah, this is very much the, the vlog that I nearly delayed, despite it actually going out on time, because I've got a little bit of man flu. And I say man flu, it's more like sinus issues. And I don't know if you've had them before, I'm sure you have. But the pressure, like obviously around your eyes, your head, your jaw, um, a little bit on both sides, it almost felt like, feels like, uh, I don't think it is, but it almost feels like toothache. But the fact that it's kind of everywhere else, it's like, oh, bloody hell. You know, if you've had it before, you'll know what I mean but it's just, it can come on kind of randomly. It's not persistent. It's not there all the time. Like right now I can't feel it, but then like an hour or two from now it could come on and it feels like it's really kind of pulsating. But the worst part of it, and I've had this for probably like a couple of days now, two, two or three nights, and it can actually at times prevent you from going to sleep or wake you up. This kind of dull sensation, like kind of there right at the back, or, or sometimes it kind of varies and it's like bloody hell. So yeah, I've been sneezing, I've been sniffling. Um, I've always had sinus issues anyway, really. Uh, again, I know a lot of people do, but if you've had that before, where it like, literally kind of hurts, it's not agony to the point of like, you know, I need to go to the hospital or something, it's not that bad, but it's um, bloody hell, what a nightmare that is. So I nearly just thought, you know what? I'm just gonna make this uh, video next week, but that would be a bit lame not to make a video just because I've got a bit of a sinus issue going on. So, um, but yeah, whinging already. I've only been going a minute or so. Um, and the t-shirt as well, I just noticed, I put this on, it was fine, and it's all bloody creased. It doesn't look this bad in person, but on here, it, oh God, just love complaining. So the diet, I know you're all asking about the diet. Oh, I say diet, more of a healthy eating kind of routine uh, that I was promising to go on, and I started off really well. You'll remember if you go back to my last vlog, now not the week leading up to that vlog, which was rubbish, I'd fallen off the, I was gonna say wagon, the exercise bike, I guess, really. The two weeks before that were really good. I was regularly on the bike, I was watching what I was eating, and I was starting to feel really good. Um, genuinely, even though it was just two weeks, I felt kind of, I wouldn't say fit or in shape. Obviously, you can't do that much in two weeks when you've not really done that much exercise for years. But I felt more vibrant, more alert, more, just more of a spring in my step. But the week leading up to the vlog, yeah, I'd caved in, I'd had crisps and chocolates, you name it, it's ridiculous. And the last two weeks since the last vlog have been awful, absolutely scandalous. Back to square one, more crisps than ever, chocolate, fizzy drinks. I don't really have that many fizzy drinks these days, but I have this past week. And yeah, pizza uh, with more fizzy drink. You name it, basically. Crackers, cheese. I mean, everything, I guess, is fine in moderation, but I've not had moderation. It's just been saturation. It's been ridiculous. So hopefully, by the time I make the next brew, a couple of weeks from now, I'll be able to report that. Do you know what? I'm actually doing really well. I've got back on the bike, and it's all going to plan. So anyway, what have I been watching lately? I've been watching a couple of things quite recently. Uh, first thing I've been watching is Cobra Kai. Now, I first found out about this I think it only been on, is it YouTube? I think it's a YouTube exclusive. I only found out like a couple of days after it had already been on. I don't know where I saw it. Well, actually, no, I do. I think, oddly enough, it was on YouTube and like an ad came up and it was really annoying. And I went to like close it down. It was like one of those pop-up things. And I don't know why my ad blocker didn't get rid of it, actually. But I'm glad it didn't because as I was about to click off it to get rid of it, because it was annoying, I noticed like the Karate Kid references and I thought, oh, what's this? So I kind of watched the trailer pan out and I thought, that looks really good. But anyway, so I sat down and watched it earlier on today, actually. And yeah, so after like weeks and weeks and weeks of wanting to watch it, I finally sat down and watched the first episode. So all I've got to go on so far is episode number one. There's 10 altogether. And I know there's been a second series which has been commissioned, which is probably going to be next year now. So yeah, one episode down and I really like it. It's really nailed that kind of 80s vibe. The music is brilliant, like the intro music. Brilliant in the ter in terms of it's nostalgic. It's that kind of heavy, hard, um, kind of hair metal, if you like. That rock music that was so prevalent back then. And it suits everything so well. Even the title screen looks 80s. 
It's a proper kind of throwback and a homage to that era. But of course, it's, it's basically the people in uh, The Karate Kid, it's them in the present day. So it's not like based in the 80s, it's modern day. Uh, but in many ways, some of them haven't kind of moved on. Like the characters, one in particular, uh, the main bad guy is kind of still stuck in the past a little bit. Uh, for obvious reasons, he's still bearing a grudge uh, from how he lost. But yeah, I'm really liking it. And what it's reminded me is, that, and I knew this anyway, but it's reminding me that the 80s, when it came to like action shows, it's reminding me that they not just were really good and fun, but they didn't take themselves too seriously. They did, I mean, there was obviously some shows that were very graphic and violent, but usually they didn't show too much violence. Not like in terms of like heads coming off and all that kind of stuff, which a lot of things have these days. There's a lot of gore, a lot of detail in modern TV. I don't think you always need to see that. It can be a bit cheap and cheesy like it was in the 80s. But that was fine because it reminded you that it was just all about fun. It wasn't too, it didn't take itself too seriously. And I really like that. And that's one of the reasons, I mean, nostalgia aside, obviously, but one of the reasons I still like going back and watching a lot of the 80s stuff, you know, the A-Team and things like Manimal, if anyone remembers that one, and um, Knight Rider, all the classics, all, or Quantum Leap, you name it, The Fall Guy. I love watching all that stuff. And so it, it's just really well done. It's basically like, like I said, big homage to the 80s, but based in, in modern day, uh, 2018, in, uh, in LA, I guess. Can't even remember, I think it's in LA. So, but yeah, if you haven't watched it, if you don't know about it, Cobra Kai, watch it. It's on YouTube. I think it's, I heard something about YouTube Red, whatever that is. Now I clicked on all 10 episodes. Like I said, I only watched the first one, but just to see if they'd all start, and they do. But I know some people back in the UK who were telling me on Facebook, like friends of mine, that they couldn't watch the first, or they could only watch the first two or three, and the rest were behind like some kind of paywall. So I don't know if it's like an American thing. I'm not sure on that front. But yeah, check it out, if, especially if you like the 80s stuff, if it's nostalgic, and if you remember and like The Karate Kid. And who doesn't? It's really good. So check it out, and uh, yeah, I'll talk more about it in my next vlog in two weeks' time. And then the other thing I've been watching, uh, this is one for the football fans, but wait, don't tune out. It's called 89. And I found this really fascinating. It's basically based on the uh, title decider between Arsenal and Liverpool, or I guess Liverpool and Arsenal to be matter of fact, because it was taking place at Anfield, home of Liverpool, of course. And it was uh, the situation where basically it was the last game of the Football League season in the 88-89 season. And uh, Arsenal was second. They had to go to Liverpool, who were the best team in the land at that time. They'd been dominant for you know, best part of 15, 20 years, winning everything all the time. If they weren't winning, they were finished second. They were just the team of the 70s and the 80s. And uh, yes, yeah, so Liverpool were, were top of the league, going into the last game of the season, playing against Arsenal, who were second. And Arsenal had to go to Liverpool and they had to win. But they didn't just have to win the game. They had to win by two goals. So one wouldn't have been enough. They had to win by two. And, and what are the chances of that? It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it'll probably never ever happen again. And uh, and not just that, but of course they did it. They won 2-0. And they didn't just win 2-0, but they scored with pretty much the last kick of the match. So it's so dramatic. So that the movie or the documentary, if you like, documentary film movie, whatever it is, it, it talks about the whole season. Uh, it skirts over a few things, of course, but it lasts nearly an hour and a half. Um, oddly enough, which is obviously the length of a, of a game, 90 minutes. So it's a little bit short, uh, shorter than that, I think, but not too much shorter. And so it, it talks about the season, how it panned out. There's interviews with uh, George Graham, like modern day, because this film only came out last year, I think. So, or maybe it was this year, but it was probably made like a year ago. And yeah, interviews with George Graham and Tony Adams, players, the captain at the time, uh, the goalkeeper, John Lukic, Alan Smith, Perry Groves, Nigel Winterburn, Lee Dixon, others. Michael Thomas, of course, who scored the, the famous goal. And it's just really good. Again, it's one of those, just like Cobra Kai, it's nostalgic. It's the 80s, albeit right at the end of the decade. And I just found it fascinating. And many people in this day and age, because if you think back to when City won the league just a few years ago, with the crucial game against QPR, and um, yeah, two goals in injury time, and that was incredible. Dzeko with the equaliser, with the header from the corner, and then Aguero, obviously, with the famous winner. And that that's a very, very famous um, game, obviously. But I think... For me, which it's an odd thing to say being like a fan of City, but for me, the Arsenal game, it, it beats it hands down because of the circumstances, 
because Liverpool was so good, uh, so good at time, because Arsenal had to go to their stadium and win, but they had to win by two and to score the last second goal. It's, it's just incredible, it really was. And throughout the course of the season, Arsenal had blown like a 19-point lead. Liverpool had whittled it down game by game, you know, coincided with Arsenal's bad run. Liverpool were winning, they had the experience. And, uh, and then for it to come down to the last game of the season, unbelievable how it panned out. So, yeah, fans being interviewed, a few like celebrities and all that kind of stuff. I say celebrities, some Z-listers really, some I've not seen for a good few years. Um, but I really, really liked it. So, yeah, I think for modern football uh, fans, especially like a younger demographic, the ones who have grown up in the Premier League era, then they're going to pinpoint the Aguero goal as the greatest kind of climax to a season ever. Yeah, for them it was. But if you're a little bit older, not too old, but if you're a little bit older, and I remember watching the game on TV, then you just you cannot beat the 1989 game. It's just unbelievable. And if I were a Liverpool fan, I don't think I'd be able to watch it because it must hurt still all these years later. Just to blow the league in such spectacular style like that, it's, it's absolutely insane. And I tell you the other thing I noticed about it, and it's just a sign of the times. It's football has changed, of course it has, because of money, of course. But the amount of English and British players playing back then for all the teams, it was basically everybody was British. There was like maybe one in every three or four teams was from somewhere outside of the UK and Ireland. And it's just, um, wow, unbelievable. It just goes to show that it, it obviously it's a global game anyway. Um, but I kind of miss those days. And it sounds slightly almost borderline xenophobic, which obviously I'm not. But it does, you, the, the minute you start talking about things like that, about all foreigners, people, you know, add two and two and they get 11. And um, that's obviously not the case. If, if someone's good enough, then play them. I don't care where they're from. But at the same time, it's that romanticised, nostalgic view. It just reminds me of when football really was all about the fans. It was about the community and players were, were local. And it just doesn't happen anymore. That money has, it's helped the game in so many ways, football, but... It's also ruined it in many, many other ways. Stadiums going up, they're all very clean and they're safe. It's obviously very important. But they all look the same for the most part. And it's there's something about football, man. Uh, I'll talk about it briefly later on. Um, but there's something about modern day football. I, I do love it. Uh, why? I, I like it, but it's, I don't know. Maybe you just get older, you just hark for the past, I guess. Nostalgia again, isn't it? But um, even the, the money that the players are on back then, there was a segment in the clip, in the movie, where George Graham was saying, right, if you're late for training or if you do something wrong, I'm going to find you 10 quid. 10 quid, could you imagine that? Players in this day and age would be like, 10 quid. They probably wouldn't care if you find him, you know, 100 grand. It doesn't make any difference. 10 pounds, unbelievable. And then he said, and if you don't pay your 10 pounds, if you haven't given it to me within the week, he says, I'm going to get Sheila, who was like the club secretary or someone, I'll get Sheila to dock 10% of your wages. 10%, unbelievable. So it just kind of highlights really how little they were on. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're still the top players, even back in the late 80s, would still have been on, I reckon, a good couple of grand a week, two, three grand, which with inflation would be like, I don't know, five, six, seven grand now. So they were still very well paid, but they were well paid to the point where they weren't off the scale well paid. You know, they used to live in normal houses, whereas footballers these days at the elite level, I mean, they don't live in normal streets like you and I, like they used to, it just doesn't happen anymore. So, yeah, anyway, I've, I've talked about that for too long. Um, I can go on a bit of a tangent about football. I love the sport. I don't really like where it's at in terms of the money, especially when you think of, like, food banks, people starving, people being out of work. I know it's not the fault of the players. They're offered a contract, they're going to sign it. But all that money, really, is that fair? It's a little bit out of control, isn't it? I've got to be honest. Part of me feels football should be regulated by the government which some people might be like, oh, that sounds a bit severe. Um, but that way, if it was, they'd have more control over the money and then money could go to you know, the public sector. And I don't know, maybe I'm just, like I say, harking back for, for days of old, which are very, very, very unlikely to happen. But I think I've rinsed that topic. But anyway, the movie, 89 it's called. If you're an Arsenal fan, you'll love it. If you're a Liverpool fan, I think you might appreciate it to a large degree, but it might put you off. But if you're a football fan, if you're in your 30s, your 40s or older, uh, I think you'll you'll probably get a, a kick out of it. It's very, very good. So that's that. Let's have a swig of uh, tea and then I'll tell you what I've been playing. Got a few um, props. Well, actually one prop. 
and that main one I'm going to show you. It's been like an Amiga Fest, an Amiga and Atari ST Fest I've been on lately. So again, it's, it's harking back to the days, well and truly stuck in the past, of like the late 80s and the early 90s and all that kind of stuff. But I've been playing Turrican. I love that noise. I'm probably knackering the discs, but um, Turrican on the Amiga. This is absolutely brilliant. I've showed this before. It would have been on a pickup vid. And obviously you've got to see the spines. Um, yeah, the funny thing about this is I put this on the other day and I got to, how many levels are there? I think it was like 14. It says on the back, 13 levels with over 1,300 screens. So yeah, 13 levels. Now I don't know for a matter of fact, but I think I got to maybe the 10th level, which I think is the furthest I've ever got on the Amiga or the ST version. And like I say, this one's the, uh, the Amiga. You can even see it down there, just about. So on the Amstrad, I'm pretty certain back in around about 1989, 1990, I'm pretty certain that I finished it, but I'm also pretty certain that I cheated. I used like a, a level skip or an invincibility cheat or something like that. I'm sure I did. I can't remember off the top of my head what the, le the end of the game looked like, the last boss or anything like that. But I do remember, I think, finishing the game. But yeah, in terms of uh, the 16-bit computers, I was sitting there, I was playing it, and I was just getting further and further and further. And there's parts of it which were brutal. Parts of it which are really unfair. Like, if you fall down like what is like a bit of a trap, and if you miss the ledge, then it respawns you where you've missed the ledge. So you've got no choice but to basically use up a continue, and then it'll start you back from either the checkpoint or the start of the level. So I found that was really, really unfair. Um, you know, a real um, reminder of how difficult games back in the day were. Modern games, of course, are very good, but they hold your hand a lot. Uh, for the most part, games back in the 80s and the 90s, for that matter, very, very challenging. Um, but that's a good thing, I think, even though it can be quite stressful. So, yeah, it's it basically, you'll all know bloody Torrican, surely. But as you can see, it's just kind of a run-and-gun side-scroller. And, uh, yeah, can you hear that again? Another truck. There's always a truck, a big bloody truck going by. I don't know if you heard it, but it's so obnoxious. And, um, but yeah, I guess that's just life, isn't it? And there's another one. As soon as I say that, two for the price of one. You may not have heard either one, but trust me, it's bloody annoying. When you're right by the window. So yeah, side scrolling, run and gun, platformer. Absolutely loving it. And uh, yeah, I could have technically carried on in the game. I think I still had to continue left. But I thought, you know what, what's the point? I, there's no urgency. I don't have to complete it. And I've had this game for years. Uh, well, this one I only relatively recently bought, but originally, you know, when I bought it, it was years back when it came out. So, you know, it's been like nearly, nearly 30 years, so why do I need to finish it now? Just take my time. And then the other two things I've been playing on the Amiga, I don't have a physical game to show you because I've downloaded the ROM and I put it on a DIT or an ADF, which is technically a ROM, put it on a blank disc and then played that through my Amiga 600. And the first game is Jaguar XJ220, which is really, really good. It's one of those games that reminds me specifically of a friend of mine who I've mentioned several times lately as well, called Rob. And I vividly remember when he got his Amiga 600 and he brought the, the game into school. Well, technically, that's not quite true. He's, I think he was given me, or his dad was given us both a lift somewhere after school. And um, his dad had a package in the car, which had arrived in the mail. And Rob was obviously at school. So his dad brought it with him somewhere that when we were on our way to wherever we were going, Rob opened it up in the car and I remember seeing just the box at XJ2220 or 220, however you pronounce it. And uh, I just, yeah, just thought it looked absolutely great. We went round his house later that day or the weekend or whenever it was, put it on and it was, yeah, it was really, really cool. But it was only up until recently, just a few days back, that I played it myself, or at least for many, many years. I think I may have had it back in like the mid 90s, but very briefly. Uh, but either way, even since the mid-90s, it's been a long time, and I put it on. And I've got to be honest, it plays really well. The music's fantastic, graphically looks very nice, and I liked it. The, the music as well, it was something about it. It just seemed to really capture the era well, very well, to the point where I could just sit back and listen to it. And in fact, I did. I just stopped the race completely, and the music was going on in the background. And it just felt like I was there back in, like, 1992. It's incredible. It really is how kind of music can be so evocative. It's really good. It's really and then the other game, the other Amiga game, which I've been playing via a blank disc, is Lotus Turbo Challenge 2. And it's really, really good. I've got to be honest, as a fan of these games back in the day, back on the 8-bit systems and back on the 16-bit ones as well, I put this game on with a little bit of trepidation. I honestly thought, how's this game going to play? Let's move that up a little bit, actually. I don't know why. Um, 
yeah, I, I honestly thought, how is this going to play? Is it going to be a little bit bad? Uh, is it going to be ropey in terms of graphics? Which I can cope with, but how is the playability going to be? That was my main concern. And I've got to be honest, maybe it's that shrouded with nostalgic bias, but Lotus 2 still plays really well. I was there with the zipstick in hand, not a euphemism, and yeah, it was really, really good. Very responsive. Uh, the music was great, of course. Most games are on the Amiga. And um, music as well by Barry Leach, if you remember from my previous vlog, who's got music on that new game called Chase Turbo Horizon or something like that. Maybe I've got that <laughs> in the wrong, wrong order. Bit of dyslexia going in there. I think it's Chase Turbo Horizon or Chase Horizon Turbo. Maybe I had it right first time. Whatever it is, but he did the music on that new game. And of course he did it on the, the old one as well, uh, on the Lotus 2. Uh, from back in like 91 maybe it came out so i think going forward what my music vids are gonna be uh, the last one was a little bit like this it's not so much going to be a pickup vid as in this is what i've just bought recently it's going to be a combination of this is what i bought recently along with what i've been listening to and in some cases i could have had these cds or records for years but i'm just listening to them again um you know get my money's worth getting educated or re-educated and maybe hopefully influencing some of you guys and girls into um, maybe a new artist that you've never heard of or maybe one you want to rediscover. So yeah, if it's just constantly just a video of pickup vids all the time for uh, the music stuff, I, I don't know, I just, it doesn't really appeal to me as much these days. I'd much prefer to make it like a music vlog in a way, uh, talking about what I'm actually listening to as well as new things, new and old things. So. But I'll save that for the video. So, yeah, without going into too much detail, the first thing I will show you is the new album by the Arctic Monkeys, Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino. So this has been very controversial, uh, overly so in my mind. Basically, a lot of people have been up in arms uh, because it sounds uh, totally different to the Arctic Monkeys' other albums. But And, and it does, to be fair. It's more of um, a jazz-influenced album. It's not a jazz album but there's clear influences on there. There's minimal guitar work, but there is guitars on the album, or there are guitars on the album. Some people went into overdrive and said, oh, there's no guitars whatsoever. And of course, people start retweeting it because of social media, they believe what they read. And then they start saying it in tweets by themselves. There's no guitar music, it's terrible. It's like, have you actually listened to this or did you just listen to someone on YouTube or read someone's tweet and take it as matter of fact? So. I can understand how maybe a younger demographic and or people who love their earlier stuff, why and how they haven't really taken to this. But for me, I really like it, I've got to be honest. Again, I'll go into more detail next week when I make the video. But um, I enjoy it, and I knew I would. It's a little bit like the Noel Gallagher shenanigans. You know, when that started with, uh, with his last album, social media went into bloody overdrive, they went into meltdown because, oh, you know, it's not as good as his, his other stuff. It's not as good as Liam's album. It's not the same as Liam's album. It's his, it's his brother, but they're different people, different music. There's a slight correlation there, but it is ultimately different. And I really liked Noel Gallagher's last album. I thought it was brilliant, to be honest. So I knew that when social media started not to like this Arctic Monkeys album, I knew I'd like it. And sure enough, I do. So that's that. And just a couple of tracks, which I really liked straight away. Um, well, I think the actually Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino, the title of the album, is an amazing track. I really like that. That one uh, sticks out. Four out of five, I think, is really, really good. I think that is the single they've gone with, maybe the opening single. So, but really, all together, um, as a whole, I really like it. But once again, I'll go into more detail next week. And then there's a couple of CDs. Uh, both of these I've had for absolutely ages. Uh, this first one came out in 1984. Believe it or not, I've not had it since 1984, quite clearly. Um, but uh, my dad probably had it, might still do, I don't know. And it's Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. Now, a lot of people may be thinking immediately, well, you're just associating it with, like, Relax, or maybe Two Tribes. And, yeah, maybe they were their biggest songs, but they did have some other good ones. I mean, The Power of, of Love, you'll know The Power of Love if you hear it. That was a massive song back in the day. I think it was actually a Christmas song, without actually mentioning Christmas in the lyrics. But yeah, that's a really good one. Uh, the, uh, again, the title of the album, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome, is a really, really, really good song. So I've really been getting into this. The early kind of 80s, that new wave um, with a bit of synth pop and just pop in general, I'm really in that kind of mood at the moment, which has prompted me to listen to that. And then this one, 
is, funnily enough, they started off as a synth pop band, uh, but they very rapidly changed direction once Vince Clark left, and Vince Clark went on to form Erasure with Andy Bell. But Vince Clark was responsible for many of the early songs of this next band, which is Depeche Mode. So when you think of things like Just Can't Get Enough, uh, that was Vince Clark, I think, who wrote that song, and he's in the video and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that is, is just a million miles away from stuff that they ended up doing. They became very kind of dark and borderline kind of the gothic in a way. Not full on, but that kind of borderline stuff. Uh, very kind of dark rock. But uh, yeah, and I didn't really used to like it. But in more recent years, I've definitely got into that kind of Depeche Mode um, sound. It's very kind of unique. It's very much them. It's like they almost created that sort of... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? That Just that sound, that vibe, that genre, if you like. I'm sure literally they didn't, but it seems to me as if they did, because I wasn't really familiar with many bands who did something similar to this up until De uh, Depeche Mode. So yeah, this is a really good album. It's called Ultra. It came out in 1997, and uh, It's No Good is a brilliant song. Uh, Barrel of a Gun is another good one. Um, yeah, it's just a really, really good record. And much like the early 80s stuff with the synth pop, and the uh, kind of new wave. I'm all, also right now, at this moment in time, really liking a lot of the borderline cheesy stuff really from the late 90s, but some of it is really good. A lot of the late 90s stuff kind of skipped me by in terms of really sitting down and listening to it. Of course I had the odd CD here and there. Uh, I would have seen it on TV and heard it on the radio. It's not like I was oblivious to it and I'm just discovering it for the first time, but it kind of, a lot of it went over my head because I was still into that kind of Britpop thing. That was my tunnel vision. And there was a few artists and a few genres here and there which I occasionally allowed in uh, into my little Britpop world. But generally speaking, if it wasn't that kind of sound, I didn't really pay too much attention. So it's only now I'm going back to like the late 90s and really starting, like I say, not to hear it for the first time. I heard it then, but I'm starting to appreciate it now. And then last but not least, before we get to the questions, is uh, a book I've been reading. It's a football book, so again, I know not everyone's into their football, but I love this. I've not finished reading it, I've just started it. It's called Dean Court Days, Harry Redknapp at AFC Bournemouth. And it's just come out, actually. I think it was only released maybe two months ago. And uh, someone put a tweet out and I thought, I'm gonna get that. So I pre-ordered it, oh, no, I didn't pre-order it, I think it just come out. I ordered it from the UK because on Amazon.com in America, I think it was like, I'd pay an extra like $10, which isn't a lot of money, that's about six quid. But also it would have taken an extra week and a bit to get here. So I think basically Amazon.com was just gonna order it from like a UK um, shop, whatever the term is, or seller, and then ship it over to me. And I thought, you know what? I might as well just get it sent from Amazon UK. And I did, and it was cheaper to get it sent from Amazon UK direct to me. And it's really, really good. It basically, in chronological order, at least that's how it's been so far, it goes through Harry Redknapp's time at Bournemouth, through each season, and yeah, just about his experiences as a player initially in the early 70s, and then he left to go to America, and then he came back to manage the club, player manager, and then he eventually left in like the push in the mid 90s, like early to mid 90s, and uh, went to West Ham and so on and so forth. And it's just really fascinating. Because, of course, for many of you, you'll know that when I was a kid, and I think I was around about 10, 9 or 10, we moved down to Bournemouth. We moved down to the Bournemouth area. And so Bournemouth are a club who are very close to my heart. I used to go to a lot of the games. And obviously, this was when Harry Redknapp was manager. Uh, I was ball boy on a few occasions. I was a junior cherry, which was like the, the club um, the, the, the club that the kids were in, like the official club. We'd get like birthday cards and we'd go to club parties meet the players, uh, like I say, you could be mascot and ball boy and all that kind of stuff, free tickets to games, and uh, often I'd go as well um, with my friend and his dad, and with other people too, so I used to go to a lot of games back then, particularly in the late 80s when we first moved down there, up until kind of like the early to mid 90s, and then after then I kind of went sporadically really, but when Harry Redknapp was there, that was when I used to go a lot, so going through the chronological seasons is so nostalgic, and he's pinpointing things in the game, talking about specific games where I was the ball boy. And it's just fascinating to read like an insight, you know, as to what he was thinking at the time and, and things that happened during that game. It, it's just brilliant. And again, with me being so nostalgic, it's just those kind of books are right up my street. So, um, yeah, I may talk about it in more detail once I've read it. 
uh, possibly on another vlog in the future. But yeah, really, really liking it. That's Dean Court Days, Harry Redknapp at AFC Bournemouth, and I'm absolutely loving it so far. I'm only a few pages in, and I'm loving it, and I know I'm absolutely going to love it. Um, by the time I finished it, so that's that. Let's move on to the questions. So thank you everyone who's asked me questions. Uh, I didn't deliberately fish for them last week. I know it may have looked like I did, maybe I did a little bit, uh, where I went, oh, not many questions this week. Uh, and then obviously a lot of you felt very guilty, uh, understandably, and <laughs> asked me questions. So thanks for that. Um, I, honestly, I didn't mean to fish for it, um, but of course it's nice to get them. So if you have any for two weeks time for the next brew, please ask me and I'll do my best to answer them, as long as I've not asked them before, or answered them before, I should say. And um, yeah, because I, I always say, there's no point doing repetition, people get very bored very quickly. So, and I don't mind what the question is, it could be about music, could be football, could be something which is in the news, could be something that you really like and you want it for whatever reason, uh, you want to know what I think about it, uh, it could be about anything, feel free to ask, it's entirely up to you. So yeah, please feel free to, um, to put that in the description box below. So the first set of questions, or the first question, is from James KEA83. Or is that James Kia83? And James's question is, if I can just bring it up here. Oh, here we go, right. So, are there any things you wish you'd done in your 30s that maybe you didn't? Or, to put more, more of a positive spin on the question, are there things you plan to do over the next decade or so that are inspired from anything you've learned in your 30s? The big four zero, yeah, I know that's for me this year, unbelievably, seems a pivotal time for a lot of people. Would be good to hear your take on what you have learned about life from the last five to 10 years. So yeah, the big four zero for me this year. Oh man, life. how did that happen? How do we get older? It's just ridiculous. The thing about getting older is I don't feel like I'm basically 40. I don't feel that. I um, Well, some days I do, especially when you start to get like, pain and stuff and you know, sinus infections and you, bones start like creaking around um, but that's just basically because I'm on fear I think once I get back into shape I'll be a lot better uh, I do, yes I don't so much feel older I think with age you I'll speak for myself of course you feel wiser you you absorb in more knowledge and you you kind of you learn you know what to say and what not to say sometimes uh, you know what you like you know what you stand for and what you want to stand for and what you won't stand for and you don't really waste your time as much. You don't really sit on the fence. You become a little bit more confident as well, maybe. I think those are things which are, um, are definitely played a part for me as my 30s have come to a close. So, um, yeah, but things that I wish I have done in my 30s, I don't really, I know you said, or oh, to put a more positive spin, but just to slightly tackle that bit, I don't think there's anything I wish per se that I did uh, because I don't really have any regrets. Uh, in life. There's things that, yeah, maybe I should have done, maybe I shouldn't have done. We can all say that, but it happened or it didn't happen, move on and be the better person and just, you know, if it's something you really want to do, then do it in the future. You know, do it now, do it today, do it tomorrow. Doesn't matter that you didn't do it in the past. Um, so yes, that's that bit. And then to put more positive spin on the question, as you've said, are there things you plan to do over the next decade or so? I mean, nothing immediately springs to mind as such other than just to maybe not waste time if there are things which I can't immediately think of but if there are things which I want to do then just do them just do them because time does fly my 30s have flown by it's absolutely ridiculous I've basically been in America for pretty much all of my 30s I came to America at 30 um, just into just not long after my 30th birthday so Basically, all my 30s have been in America, and I haven't even been back to the UK on holiday. So that'll be interesting when I go back there. A whole decade has just gone by. Crazy. So, yeah, it's a difficult one, James, because I can't really answer the question in the sense that there's nothing that I can think of immediately as I'm making this vid that I really wish I'd have done in my 30s, which I want to do in my 40s. But obviously there will be some things. Um, but the key thing is... I think I'm just gonna going forward as of kind of now really onwards. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do it. I'm not I'm not gonna procrastinate. Um if I want something I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna aspire to it, I'm gonna aim to do it, I'm not gonna put things off, which is maybe what I was guilty of doing in the past. I think you just get sometimes you take things for granted and but yeah, all the time, you know, time's ticking by and we're all getting older. And you might not look it, you might not feel it, 
uh, in some cases, but we're all getting older, obviously. And uh, what I don't want, the big thing that I don't want, even though I don't have any regrets now, because I still feel I'm young enough, I still feel I can get away with shaving a few years off my age sometimes, maybe not today, but I don't want to look back, say, 20, 30 years from now and think I wish I'd done, you know, I wish this had happened or that had happened or I wish I wasn't so lazy enough that, etc, etc. I can't think of specific examples, but whatever it may be, I don't want to look back with any regrets. So which is, as a result of getting to 40 this year for me, what I want to start doing is to basically uh, acting upon all the things that I want to do. Does that make sense? Kind of felt like I was kind of talking bollocks there, quite frankly. But I think I just about got the message over. So no regrets uh, that I've that, from things that I've not done in the past, because uh, nothing I've not done anything that bad in the scheme of things. Have there been some things which I wish I would have done? Well, to a degree, but there's nothing that I haven't done that I can't do in the future. So thank you, James. Next set of questions from Justin Moseley. Uh, first one is: Do you prefer uniform game packaging like PS4? Or the oversized and varied, sorry, oversized and varied game packaging of the 16-bit computers. Yeah, like that's on that side, of course it is. Down there's a few Amiga games you can't quite see. Yeah, the Amiga games were either massive boxes or they were like small boxes or the budget labels. They were different, weren't they? They weren't as varied. Oh, sorry, they were, they were very varied. They weren't as uniform, as you say, with like the PlayStation 4, the Xbox One, modern games in general. Um, and you know what? It kind of works both ways for me because when it comes to like Nostalgia, here we go again. Uh, obviously, I love the old stuff. It, it looks great. I love the old boxes. I really do appreciate how they are all different. It makes them unique. Uh, I do like that. But at the same time, I am a fan of uniformity. So when you've got like a load of PS4 games on your shelf, for example, uh, with that kind of blue spine at the top or the blue logo, that looks pretty good. The Xbox One games, which are pretty much universally uh, entirely grey with white writing, well, not necessarily white. I know there's a few yellow and red and, and maybe a little bit of blue, but generally they don't really veer too far away from that colour scheme. Uh, but I quite like it. The Nintendo Switch uh, is red and white predominantly. Uh, I don't mind that, but I'm not a massive fan of it. Ultimately, I know spines of games aren't that important. I get that. It's all about the games. But, um, yeah, I think... To answer your question, do I prefer uniform game packaging? I think I probably prefer the retro stuff because it, it's different, it's unique. The artists had a bit more freedom to do what they wanted in terms of the artwork and the people who were designing the boxes. So me, I like them both, but I'd probably say I prefer the oversized and varied game packaging of the 16-bit computers, as you put it. So that's what I'd say. Question number two from Justin. What are your favourite gaming YouTube channels? Now this is funny because I was watching a video maybe like a few weeks back and it was this, uh, a YouTuber obviously, funnily enough, on YouTube and he was making a vid, part of the gaming community. I don't think I've ever left comments on his videos before. If I have, it was ages ago and I'm not sure if he's done it on mine. I don't even know if he's subscribed to me. Uh, again, if he has left comments, it would have been ages ago because I don't recognise his name from any time recently. But I, I quite like him, he seems like quite a nice guy, nothing bad to say about him whatsoever. I don't tend to comment, but I do tend to watch. For whatever reason, there's a stack of YouTubers out there who I watch their stuff and I just don't comment, or very, very rarely. And I think, I say for whatever reason, I think the reason is, I, I just haven't, again, for whatever reason, even though I said to think the reason, um, for whatever reason, I've just never really got that kind of relationship that friendship going maybe because I didn't leave comments uh, in the past and maybe they didn't do it on mine so all this time has passed so now it's just like I tend to watch and very seldom if ever comment uh, maybe I should start doing it more I do maybe we'll see but anyway so I was watching this person the other day who I don't comment on and his video was unfolding and it, yeah, it was an enjoyable vid I was I was enjoying it as, as the video was going on and I started to type out a comment and it would have been relatively generic, not totally generic, like great video. I don't really do things like that. I'd have mentioned something that I would have watched in the vid, uh, but quite generic in the sense that I was, you know, would have been like, oh, uh, that's a good game and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I started to type it out, but I didn't hit the post button or the send button because the video hadn't finished. And I thought, well, there may be something else that I want to, to say. 
So I kind of left it there. Maybe like some of you do when you're watching vids. Maybe when you're watching this, you've got something typed out already. Uh, be careful that it, the video doesn't end and then you lose a comment. That's a thing which I've found out much to my bloody annoyance. So sometimes if I type a, a really long comment out, before I send it, I'll copy and paste it just in case I lose it. So I've learned the hard way on that one. So anyway, this person's vid, I typed out a comment and uh, yeah, I was looking to maybe add to it before the video ended. So this person was doing a shout outs vid. It was like a pickups vid and it descended into a bit of a shout outs thing. And there was about 20 people out he was gonna name. And even though I don't recall him leaving a comment on my channel, for whatever reason, clear arrogance, obviously, I thought he was gonna mention me. I thought I was gonna get a mention. Oh, why wouldn't I? Great channel, the average channel, obviously, in reality. But I thought I was probably gonna get a mention. And he was mentioning all these YouTubers, uh, many of which who I knew, some of which I didn't naturally, because we all watch different people. And I thought, yeah, any second now. And Bluetonic78, great channel, what a guy. And of course it didn't come. Um, <laughs> and it was getting closer and closer and closer to the end. And it just got to the point where there was probably maybe five or six nominations left. And I thought, I'm not gonna get mentioned here. And I was mildly annoyed. I've gotta be honest, it sounds so ridiculous at my age, 40 this year. Uh, even saying that, I just feel like it's ridiculous. Um, but I just, yeah, I just felt mildly annoyed by the fact that this guy wasn't going to mention me. So, um, and this is going to sound absolutely awful. I'm just going to be honest. Now, I'm talking to you. You know, it's just you. No one else is in the room. You know, um, I feel really embarrassed saying this, but I'm going to be honest. This is one of the reasons I think why maybe people, it sounds a bit kind of arrogant, but maybe one of the reasons why people like my channel is because I'm honest. I'm just going to say how it is. So remember, I started to type out that comment of, oh, great pickups and blah, blah, blah. The minute he didn't mention me, I thought, well, that's it, deleting that, and I didn't leave the comment. I thought, if you're not going to mention me, I'm not leaving a comment on your channel. 40 this year, that's the mentality of me in 2018. How embarrassing. So I didn't dislike the vid or anything silly like that. That's obviously childish. Uh, I probably actually did physically, literally, click on the like button, but I didn't um, I didn't leave a comment because I thought, well, no, I'm not doing that. If you didn't, um, if you didn't nominate me in first position, no, you just didn't nominate me at all on a list of 500 people. Forget it, mate. Not happening. And, you know, now, a week or two or three later, I feel embarrassed that I didn't just leave a comment. Um, I, I should have just, <laughs> you know, not taken that silly bait, which I'd imposed on myself. And I should have just, um, just ignored it. It's so silly of me. I don't know why I didn't do that. So I may go back and leave a comment. But, of course, if I do that now, that person may be watching and then he may get paranoid because he'll know that that's that video I was talking about. Oh. Ridiculous. So that was very silly on my part. But the point that I'm trying to make, Justin, is that I'm very reluctant to name any channels because I don't want anyone to go through that same experience, i.e. immaturity, on my part, where they could be watching and they'll be like, oh, he, Alex didn't mention me. I thought, oh, huh. I thought we were friends. Oh. I don't want that. And you're, the fact is probably no one else is going to do that. It's probably just me that's so childish, uh, childish enough to even think with that mentality. But I don't want to do it. So instead, what I'll say, it's a bit of a cop out. But if, you know, we know each other and we watch each other's videos and we comment regularly or every now and again, you'll know who you are. That's that's very lame. I realise that. But what I will do is slightly answer the question and I'll mention a few channels that hardly ever get any uh, nominations or uh, who have hardly any subscribers. So there's one that I discovered relatively recently. And it's a guy, I may have his username wrong, check the description box and you can check these channels out. And his name is called Cine Steve, I think. Yeah, he just comes across as a really nice chilled out guy. I'd heard the name mentioned before, I think by Stu, 2 to UK. And, but I'd never checked out his channel. And then a few months ago, maybe, he left a comment on one of my vids. And I thought, well, that username sounds familiar. So I clicked on it and then I watched a couple of vids and I subscribed because he's a really chilled out guy. Um, Got some really good pickup vids, and yeah, he seems to like his stuff. A lot of Amiga stuff, a lot of um, a lot of 16-bit uh, stuff, basically PS1, all that kind of thing. And he's got a couple of nice arcade cabs in the back, which look pretty good behind him in the in the videos. And um, so you might want to check his channel out. He doesn't make that many vids. There was one that went up just the other day. So I'm not obviously overly familiar with his channel or with him as a person. But from what little I've watched, I really do like his stuff. So um, check him out. Also, there's Mr. Bad's Games, or is it Mr. Bad's Retro Games? I think he changed his channel name. That's Paul. I've mentioned Paul before. 
He's got a lot of Amiga stuff on. His Amiga collection is just ridiculous. So good. You might want to check his channel out. Uh, there's Mark, the Joy of Sticks. Again, specialises in the Atari ST. Brilliant channel, Mark. He's so chilled out as a person. And uh, yeah, he just very, very seldom swears. I mean, I don't even... If you, um, listen, I'll say things like bloody and like, dickhead, knobhead, you know, uh, bollocks. I mean, to me, that's not really swearing. Maybe I'm delusional. But um, yeah, I don't really see that swearing. Not really. It's very tame stuff. But I don't think Mark... He might have said one or two in the past, but he's very, very careful of what he says. When it comes to the real swear words, he doesn't do any of that. And I don't think I've ever done that. I'm not a prude. I don't mind other people doing it. But yeah, I just don't really do it myself. So there's a few channels to check out. There's probably a lot, lot more. But what I may do in the future, Justin, you've just reminded me, is maybe do like a shout out vid. But that's just three people who immediately spring to mind. I know really, if I was to think about it for a, for a lot longer, there's loads of small channels. I say small, I think Mark's got more subscribers than me, the joy of sticks. But it's small in the sense that um, most people who subscribe to him are probably Atari ST kind of based. If you're watching my channel, I don't think there's too many people who watch my stuff, who watch his stuff. So he's kind of, he may be new to you in that sense. So yeah, um, I'll put those channels in the description box, but maybe going forward, especially for smaller channels, what I may do in the coming weeks, I may do like a standalone shout out vid or put it on a vlog. Maybe for channels who have got less than 500 subs. Maybe I'll do that, Justin. So thanks for the, uh, the recommendation. Even though it wasn't really a recommendation, I've given it myself. <laughs> but as a result of you asking the question. Question number three, is it time for PS5? I think so. I've got to be honest. Um, for me, a lot of the games are starting to look quite samey. Uh, we started to get, for me, when it came to the, the PS3 and the 360, it got to like 2011, maybe 2010. And all the games that were coming out were, were pretty much looking the same. And for me, I'm starting to see that with a lot of the PS4 and Xbox One games. Um, obviously, I've not seen all the stuff that's going to be due out at E3 in the next couple of days or a few days, whatever it is. So maybe the graphics may have gone up to a, a new notch and uh, the, the scope, the universe of the worlds, maybe more immersive and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but so far, to me, personally, a lot of the games are starting to look quite similar. Um, so, yes, I think we are due for uh, PS5. But I, I don't know when the next one's due out. It's probably going to be the next kind of couple of years or so, isn't it? But for me, yeah, they should be looking into... They're probably making it already, of course. Um, but the reality is that if it does come out, I'm guessing it's going to be at least a couple of years. Maybe next, but that could be a stretch. So that is that one. Question number four. As an Amiga fan, were you ever tempted by the CD32 back in the day? Not so much back in the day. I knew a couple of people who had one. I knew one person who had one. I do remember vividly seeing it in like the shop window of a particular shop uh, when I was at college and we were at like a, on lunch or something and we, we saw it in the shop and we were like, it looked kind of interesting. But the thing is I had my Mega Drive at the time and the PS1 was just about to come out and the CD32 just seemed a little bit redundant. So it's not really, it didn't really interest me too much in the day. But these days, of course, on YouTube, a lot of people are buying games for it. Uh, Ash81B4U springs to mind. Uh, I'm not sure if Dave Psycho Fox has he still got his CD32? I'm not sure. Um, that's another channel. Dave should have a lot more subscribers. Maybe Ash as well. Um, links description box. So yeah, um, it didn't really then, but now in this day and age, I'm, I'm starting to look at it. Yeah, there's one or two people who have been buying games for it, showing them off, and of course that's made me go onto YouTube and put in gameplay vids and all that kind of stuff. Uh, or, or typing um, games to look and to watch gameplay vids and it looks interesting but to be honest I prefer the Amiga as a computer rather than a CD based machine so never say never but um, yeah I'm kind of looking at it but it's not so much on the radar not really but of late I have started to sort of just uh, just have a bit of a, a look from a distance so that is that and then question number five how come your accent is unchanged after 10 years in the States I think it has changed I've touched upon it before. Uh, I definitely enunciate more. Uh, I have to because people over here sometimes don't know what I'm talking about. And that sometimes comes across in my vids. I can hear it myself. Uh, whether you can or whether you can't, I, I don't know. Um, but it has. But obviously, yeah, it's, it's not as broad 
but my accent is completely split up because it's like I spent the first 10 years in the north of England and then the next like 19 or so in the south of England and then the last 10 have been in America so I've kind of been everywhere but yeah it's funny maybe I have I think I've lost my dialect but I don't think I've lost my accent but I think it's been a deliberate thing I remember as a kid not really wanting to I didn't really feel like I needed to change it to fit in to sound like southern with all like the kind of kids in in the Bournemouth area I just I didn't really want to um nothing against a, a southern accent of course but I I just I always wanted to keep my identity so I think I did and so that's why um I probably haven't lost it too much like, like I say I've lost it a little bit the more the dialect than the accent but it's funny because there's a guy in the music community uh, his name's Matt it sounds like I'm gonna insult him I'm not he seems a really nice guy um but it, like me he's a Brit in America I think he's the same age as me he might be like a year younger same age obviously technically ish and um, he's been in America for 11 years so again a similar time to me his accent has changed so much it's honestly you, you listen to it and it's like it, it just it's unbelievable it, it's definitely American has started to come through you can tell just about that he's British but it's just um, if you compare our accents when we're the same kind of age we've been in America the same amount of time it's incredible to think that um, to, to, to bear those uh, statistics in mind, it really is. His accent has changed. Why is that the case? I don't know. Maybe because um, maybe he wants it to. Maybe he's happy to let it to let it happen. Maybe I've always been cagey in losing that accent. Like I said, because when we moved down south, I I tried not to. So maybe I've come to America now. It, it's just inbuilt in me to try not to do the same. I don't know. It's really weird. Or maybe it's because I never leave the house. Maybe I'm a hermit and I don't speak to Americans. No, I'm joking, obviously I do. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I just think it's, um, some people do lose their accent and some people don't. I think it's that simple, Justin. So thank you for the questions. All right, uh, next set of questions are from Pete. Thank you, Pete. It's Nestastic. Number one, what films have you watched recently? Minute reviews are appreciated. Uh, none recently, Pete, if you ignore the Cobra Kai thing, which obviously isn't a film, and if you ignore the um, 89 Arsenal Liverpool documentary thing. Uh, I haven't watched any for absolutely ages. As you'll know, what I have done in these brews in the past is to put a segment aside to what I've been watching recently, which I guess is what I did in this vid, but it will usually be talking about um, movies. I just haven't watched one for absolutely ages. It will return, I promise. Uh, maybe next week. There's a few I want to watch. It's just finding the time and, uh, and all the rest of it. So yeah, maybe next week we'll bring that back, even though that segment is in this vid. But it was more like documentaries, TV shows, maybe for films, it'll, uh, it'll come back next week. Question number two, what are your favourite type of accessory related games? Light gun, fishing rod, steering wheel, etc. Fishing rod, yeah, it'd have to be fishing rod. No, uh, yeah, it's gonna have to be the light gun. I've not used one for absolutely ages. A fishing rod, I probably, I think I had one on a Dreamcast. Um, very, very briefly, but it's not something. Does it, is there anyone out there who would seriously say that's their favourite accessory? Maybe, I don't know. Steering wheel, I do have the steering wheel for uh, Mario Kart on the Wii, it came bundled with that. And I don't mind, it's quite responsive. But um, yeah, I'm not a massive fan. I had the steering wheel back in the mid 90s for the Sega Saturn, or late 90s technically I guess it was. I didn't really like it, it wasn't very responsive at all. It was this big sturdy thing and it broke quite easily, wasn't a massive fan. So yeah, I'm gonna have to go with a light gun. It's funny you mention that Pete, because I've been looking recently at uh, some of the light gun games on the PS3. Like there's a Time Crisis one, I think there's two or three Time Crisis games. And there's maybe one or two others. There's also the PlayStation Move stuff. Uh, there's a game called The Shoot, you should check that out. That is pretty good. I remember playing it back when I had the PlayStation Move. Um, I remember doing a, a, like a review on the PlayStation Move on my uh, channel and it was just rubbish. I shouldn't have put the video like review, it wasn't a review at all, it was just appalling. It really was. Um, but I'd like to get that back, but I think it's still quite expensive. And I think the reason those PlayStation Move controllers are still quite pricey is because they're used, aren't they, for the VR. So they've kind of held their value, or if not increased in value. So yeah, I'd say light gun for me. Question number three. Did you see the recent news that the PS5 will release in 2021? Oh, well, there we go. The previous question was about the, uh, when's it coming out or something like that, wasn't it, from um, Justin. So yeah, did you see the recent news that the PS5 will release in 2021? No, I didn't. Uh, thoughts, is it too soon? 
or the right time considering PS4 released November 2013? Well, as I just said, funnily enough, Pete, to Justin, for me, it's probably, um, you say, is it too soon? Or posing the question, is it too soon? I don't think so. I think it's about time, maybe next year, to be honest. But you've just said they're 2021. Uh, maybe Microsoft may release something a little bit sooner. They've really got to step up to the plate, Microsoft. They've lost a lot of ground. And yeah, the PS4 is absolutely dominant. Even someone like myself. I mean, I always wanted to get the PS4. I wasn't going to get the Xbox One like a lot of people. If you remember, E3 of 2013 was an absolute disaster. A disaster for Microsoft. But I really wanted one of those new generation systems for Christmas. And on Amazon and everywhere, even in the retail shops, at least where I live, they were sold out everywhere. So, uh, but every now and again, it would become available on Amazon, both the PS4 and the Xbox One. And it got closer and closer to Christmas of 2013 and being greedy and having like a week off or whatever. I wanted to play the new console at Christmas. And every time it became available, it would sell out within minutes. So I said to myself, do you know what? The next one that becomes available, I'm just gonna get it. Uh, whether it's Xbox or PlayStation, because by this time there was only about four days left before Christmas and the PlayStation was just sold out constantly, constantly, constantly and the Xbox One came up and I bought it and within about 20 minutes of buying it, even that was outsold. Uh, they sold out of, of items on, on Amazon and neither system was available after that until the new year. So I'm glad I got the Xbox when I did uh, because I could play it, the new generation of systems over the Christmas and New Year of 2013. And then when it got into, uh, yeah, over 2013, when it got into 2014, I uh, I think it was like late January, I did get the PlayStation 4, which is what I wanted all along. But really, this generation, I've gone back and forth. I've been very much in the, in the camp of Xbox, and then I've been very much in the camp of the PlayStation 4. I've really kind of swung back and forth, so to speak. Um, because of late, the past year, pretty much it's been PlayStation 4. Where I'm at right now is PS4. But I'm really looking forward to E3. I mean, I'm not massively into the industry side of things, but I'm looking forward to see what Microsoft do and, uh, and to give me an excuse to kind of play Microsoft games again because I've just lost interest, really. They do have some good games, but PlayStation is just absolutely just destroying them. So, yeah, I'm hoping Microsoft do something um, quickly. They really do need to. And I think... Their console, their next one, will probably come out either 2019 or 2020. And if you're saying, Pete, that PS5 is 2021, then Microsoft can really get a head start. I think they have to do that. If they release it on the, on the same year or in the same year, I think Microsoft could be finished. They really could. I think it's, it could be a problem. Then again, they're a massive company. Um, so even though their sales aren't anything like PlayStation, it's not like they're about to go bust. At least I wouldn't have thought so. So, yeah, ultimately, my thoughts... Uh, I think I think we're getting to that generation, as I said with Justin, where for me, a lot of the games are starting to look a little bit similar. So maybe we need that next burst of technology and graphics to come on. At least for me, that's what I think. They're still good, don't get me wrong. And they're going to look even better as the developers harness the technology even more. But we're just at a point where I can't really see a massive deal of difference from games that came out like a couple of years ago to the ones that are coming out now. Not really. Uh, at least not the ones that I've looked at, but I, I could be talking nonsense there. We'll see. Maybe E3 will show some truly, truly amazing games. We'll see. Question number four. Did you watch The Royal Wedding? Thoughts? I didn't watch it, but my wife did. Uh, she got up in the middle of the night at like three or four o'clock to watch it. And if you think I'm going to do that, forget it. Not happening. Was never going to happen. Um, but she's, she's kind of into all that stuff, so uh, she did. But I'm not going to lie. I did watch the build-up to it until around about midnight. I watched like, the live Sky News feed on YouTube, uh, and I, I, I liked it, I've got to be honest. And then when I got up like the next morning, like 7, 8, 9, whatever time I strolled out of my uh, chambers, I, um, I, I, yeah, I put it on, I watched it again. I watched some of the highlights of it. And so my thoughts on it personally is that I think it's a good thing. I don't understand the negativity. I don't get it. People whinging constantly. I mean, I know I like a bloody good whinge, don't get me wrong. But people whinging about, oh, Turks pay us money. I read something a while ago. I Take this with a pinch of salt. I'm not sure if it's true. I read something that it cost the taxpayer 63 pence per year to fund, if you like, the, uh, the royal family. 63 pence a year. Go oh, bugger off if you think that's a problem. Come on, that's just ridiculous. I, I, at least for me, I don't have a problem paying 63 pence, even though I'm not a taxpayer because I'm in America. 
but while I was there and if we move back in the future, big deal. You think about all the revenue that they bring in and not just that, but you think of the tradition. I think tradition's something to be proud of, I think, sometimes. Uh, yes, they're privileged. Of course they are. There's a number of things that you know, I'm not exactly delighted with, but they're not doing any harm. You know, just being like kind of a figurehead there. And like I say, almost like uh, something which is good for tourism and tradition and history, maintaining history. I don't know why people have got a problem with it. I think it's that thing of social media. People are very negative and, uh, and people jump on the bandwagon. But are the royal family harming you as an individual by being there? No, they're not, is the answer. Are you going to miss your 63 pence per year? You know, you're not missing your 63 pence a year. It's not a big deal. It really isn't. But that's my thoughts, Pete. I know we're all different. And if you disagree, you'll have your own reasons uh, to counter my arguments. That's, that's fine. But for me, and here's the thing, I'm not a royalist. I'm not a massive flag waver for the monarchy. But I just don't see what they're doing wrong. I don't see the, the I don't understand the need to abolish it. I think for me, if you're going to do something in life, whatever it is, you've got to have a reason for doing it. And if there are valid reasons for doing it, then fine, do it. But I just don't see the point. It seems like people want to abolish the monarchy just because they want to abolish the monarchy. It, it was like the whole Scottish independence thing. People wanted Scottish independence because they can get it. Well, what's the point? Your life isn't going to change. It may even get worse. What's the point of doing something if there's no need for it? So that's my stance on it. Uh, with the whole the Scottish independence, here's the thing with me, and I know this may not be a popular opinion um, or widely shared uh, opinion of you, but I've always considered myself more British than English. It's just a personal thing. And I think, as I touched upon in a recent vid, maybe in the last one, I think because me, if you go back three generations, I'm pretty certain that's where the English ties just go. It's all Irish, it's Scottish, uh, it's German. And of course, as I said in the last vlog, if it was the last vlog, I'm in America now, so that's a new kind of side of the family tree. Um, so the English thing pretty much dries up as far as we can track it back about three generations. So what was the question, Pete? I can't remember. It was about the Royal Wedding, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I, I didn't watch it at the time because it was in the middle of the night. But I, I genuinely think that the modern crop of uh, royal family who are around about our age, I think they are, they're more in touch with life and us as people. That, I mean, they're out of touch to a degree in the sense that they're privileged, but they are more in touch, uh, this generation of the monarchy, than anyone in the past. So I think people sometimes forget that. You know, I think Kate, William, Harry, Meghan now, makes it sound like an, I'm an expert on the bloody matter. But I think they, they're more like us than ever before. And so I think you have to bear that in mind. If we were talking about a royal family that was really, really stuck in the past, from, you know, like 100 years ago, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago especially, um, maybe that's a little bit outdated. But I don't think, I don't think they're doing any harm. And I think they do, I think they do a good thing for the country. It's my opinion. I'm just repeating myself. Question number five. Have you seen or will you be going to see Solo, a Star Wars story? I won't be going to watch it at the cinema because it's, it's not really the kind of movie that's getting me that excited. But I will watch it. I will watch it eventually, uh, whether it's a Blu-ray release, which I'm guessing will be maybe early next year, possibly Christmas, uh, or whether it's streamed on Amazon or Netflix or whatever it is. I will watch it. I've seen a number of mixed reviews on it. Uh, I've seen you talking about it, Pete, on Twitter. And a few other people, you've kind of uh, bounced back and forth with dialogue, uh, exchanging their views on it. And, and other people as well. Seems to have been a bit of a mixed reception. Uh, but all the other Star Wars movies that have come out of late received, for the most part, very mixed reviews. And I liked them all. I've liked them all. Yes, there's been some parts of certain movies that I didn't like. And I would have talked about them and all these brews in the past. But generally speaking, I thought they were alright. So I think I'm probably going to like Solo. The only thing I'll say about it is for me, when I watched the trailer or a couple of the trailers, I didn't get massively excited about it. It looked a little bit kind of, uh, a little bit too clean cut for me. Maybe it's because it's solo as a young man, as opposed to a guy who's in his late thirties or early forties, uh, which is kind of how we know him from like the Star Wars, uh, Empire Strikes Back and Jedi movies. So seeing him, obviously a different uh, actor, clearly it's not, um, Harrison Ford, obviously playing this guy in his probably early 20s or something, but it, it just, it doesn't, I don't know, I'm finding so far, just from the trailers, 
I find it quite hard to take it seriously. Uh, it might be a little bit too, um, just, just a bit too clean cut, as I say. I'm a little bit worried that the, the humour might be a little bit sort of childish. I'm not sure. I don't want to talk about it too much because I've not seen it, so I don't want to judge it. I, so yeah, I will watch it, Pete, but I'm not going to go to the cinema to watch it. As and when I do, I'll talk about it on A Brew. Poet and I don't know it. Question number six. What were your favourite wrestlers in the 80s? Yeah, back in the late 80s and the early 90s, I was massively into the wrestling, like many people were. So we're talking the obvious ones. Hulk Hogan, uh, The Ultimate Warrior, Bret the Hitman Hart. Those were probably the three main ones that I can immediately think of, but there was a stack of them. I did briefly get back into wrestling, very briefly. Uh, the early part of the millennium, late 90s, early part of the millennium. But it was really just because it was on late at night. So when I went to bed, I'd put the TV on like a timer. And, uh, and usually the wrestling was on Sky Sports really, really late at night. So, yeah, The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, that kind of stuff. Um, but really, yeah, I've not really watched it since, to be honest. I don't think I could name any modern ones, unless there's still a few wrestlers knocking around today that were still knocking around um, back then. So thank you, Pete, for those questions. Dylan Craven. Dylan Craven, of course, his dad is John Craven. Sorry, Dylan. Never gets old. Dylan's probably there going, that gets really old, mate. It wasn't funny the first time. And I should say as well, I had a comment. I felt really bad. Um, I should feel bad for um, saying it to Dylan, really. But I felt extra bad because there was a comment left on the previous vlog by Lisa. Lisa Loves. And she was like, oh, I didn't realise that. Is that actually John Craven's son? It isn't. Sorry, Lisa. It's just me being stupid. Just because of the surname. It's so unique. You know, it must be John Craven's son. It must be. It must be related. But as far as I'm aware, it, it isn't. But I say it anyway, and Dylan must be furious every time I mention it. So anyway, Dylan Craven, John's son. Question number one, as you've lived in the US for 10 years, what US sport or sports have you got into, and what is your adopted team stroke teams? Here's a funny thing, I haven't really got into any sports since I've been here. The irony is I watched more American football in the UK uh, than I do living in America for the past 10 years. I catch the odd thing here and there, I've not watched every Super Bowl. You know, the Super Bowl over here is quite a big deal, as you can imagine. People have their Super Bowl parties. People talk about it at work. Um, you might have a Super Bowl party at work, and like the day before or the week before or whatever it is. Done that in the past. And uh, But yeah, I, I know less about the sport now than I did then. Baseball, my wife's side of the family are big into baseball, so I catch the odd bit here and there. I just, I've never taken to it. It's just a poor man's rounders, let's be honest. It's not for me. Uh, ice hockey? Nah, not really. I don't mind playing video games of ice hockey, although I've not done that for years. But nah, not really into it. I like normal hockey, not like professionally, but I used to love it at school, uh, like on grass, grass hockey, field hockey, whatever it's called. Uh, what's the other American sport? Basketball? Again, not really. Briefly into it in the early 90s. In the early 90s, it was really popular with me and my friends who were at similar age, um, early teens back in the early to mid 90s. But yeah, just not into it. American soccer, if you like. I somewhat adopted the Los Angeles Galaxy, but that was really because of Beckham, to a lesser degree, Robbie Keane, but even lesser degree than that, Ashley Cole, uh, Zlatan now, of course, Ibrahimovic, Steven Gerrard as well. But not really. It's, it's kind of weird how that's how it's worked out. I, I watch a little bit of the MLS, but not too much. Uh, but American sports, I just... Never really taken to it. But I see the odd thing here and there. It's not like I'd never watch any of it. But I don't really have a team. Not really. I guess if I'm going to pick any, um, it'd be like the San Francisco 49ers because it's California. Um, like I say, maybe um, someone like... Um, who's, the, who's the bloody... I don't even know the baseball team. The, the Giants. San Francisco Giants. Uh, maybe someone like the... Uh, in basketball, they've got the... Is it the Sacramento? What are they called? Kings? I don't even know. Not even sure. Uh, I'm just not really into basketball. Basically, if I'm going to pick anybody, it'll be a team somewhere in California. You know, just um, just because of California, that's all. We did go down and we watched the Oakland Athletics play in baseball against the Yankees. And my wife's family are all big Yankees fans. They're, apart from uh, my father-in-law, his team are the Giants, San Francisco Giants, um, who I think started off as a New York team. Not really sure on that one. But you know what America's like with its franchises. It moves teams all around the country. Not a fan of that whatsoever. Uh, obviously that happened in football. 
with Wimbledon and the MK Dons. Disgraceful. Should never, ever, ever have been allowed to happen. But that's for another day. And I don't really think it's happened since. But anyway, so that's that question. Thank you, Dylan. Question number two. What was the first gig you ever went to? I think, I think the first gig I ever went to was a band called Kingmaker, who I've mentioned quite a lot. They were a brilliant band, kind of pre-Britpop, uh, indie rock, very, very, very catchy, um, melodic kind of uh, choruses, and a great songwriter, Loz Hardy. Got a lot of stick in the music press by the NME and the Melody Maker um, for maybe the way he looked, and he was quite arrogant, uh, or confident, I think, more than anything, and I don't think people liked that. Maybe it's that British thing, again, of, you know, when people are, are getting towards the top, we praise them, but the minute they get to the top, or if we think they're too cocky, well, we knock them down. We really knock them down to the bottom. You know, you can get big, but not that big. You know, you can get big on our terms. That's kind of what it is. In America, it's kind of the opposite. Don't get me wrong, that, that mentality of not liking people when they get too big for their boots exists too. But really, over here, it's like we want to push people. And if they make it, good on you. Well done. In the UK, it's like now. If you make it, but well, actually before you've made it, oh, good on you. Yeah, we'll push you. The minute you get to the top, we'll absolutely knock you down and take great enjoyment doing it as well. Just like destroying people. In America, we like building people up and keeping them there. It's, it's weird how the attitude's kind of different. So, um, yeah, but Kingmaker, anyway, I used to really, really like them. And so, well, I think it would have been that. It would have been Southampton University, 94 maybe, 94, 95. I went with my friend Sam and his brother Tom and a couple of other people, like friends of friends kind of thing. And um, yeah, in fact, it would have been 95. And it would have been as well in my diary vid. If you've not seen my diary vid of May 1995, check that out. I know I need to do the December vid. I just upon that a few minutes ago. Uh, I will do it this year, maybe December, maybe before. So I think it would have been Kingmaker. The support band were absolutely atrocious. I think they were called Shriek. And uh, that's all the woman did. She just shrieked all the way through. It was rubbish. They were absolutely appalling. But Kingmaker were good. And it was one of their last gigs ever, actually. <laughs> Make it out what you will. We went to see them and then they just quit as a band. So I think it was those. Uh, question number three. You've got a lot of vinyl. What's the most embarrassing album you've got in your collection? To kind of answer the question, but to not answer it. Because here's the thing. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed about anything that I've got. Because, because I've got it for a reason. I've got it. I bought it because I like it. It means something to me. And uh, But I will say... It's probably the London Boys, the Twelve Commandments of Dance, because it's cheesy pop, late 80s, I think it came out in 89. So, yeah, it's right at the end, bright, vibrant, illuminous colours, which were all popular at the time, that was the rage. Um, the two, the duo uh, of the London Boys were very kind of acrobatic, that was their, their routine, that's what they do. Um, but the music was really catchy, really poppy, they had a number of hits on top of the pops a few times. Again, if you're around about my age, you, you should know the London Boys. And if you don't, if you YouTube them, you'll probably recognise a couple of the songs. And I used to absolutely love them. So I had the cassette back in 1990. It was like the year after it came out, I think, in the UK. I asked for it for, for like a Christmas stocking filler. I think it was Christmas anyway. And I got it. Wore that bloody tape out. Absolutely loved it. And uh, yeah, so I had to buy the record. When I started to get back into vinyl about five years ago, I thought I've got to buy it. And I did. And I love it, but I do admit that to some, it's a little bit cheesy. But I'm not embarrassed. Uh, I really just, I just don't care. I, again, it's that thing about getting older. That's another thing. You get to a certain age. And yeah, whilst I can see to others, it could be embarrassing. To me, I couldn't care. That's what people think. Uh, because you get to a certain age, it's like you don't want to impress people. But you, if Hopefully you just, you hope people take you and accept you for who you are. So yeah, it, it is a little bit embarrassing to a degree. But ultimately, I'm, it doesn't bother me, if that makes sense. Question number four. Just for fun, what do you feel is the number one YouTube gaming channel cliche? For example, filming a vid with shelves loaded with games in the background or making clickbait rant drama type vids for views. Yeah, absolutely. When people put vinyl and games in the back to look good, that sickens me. Really annoys me. <laughs> no, I just do this because I, I think it looks all right. I don't do it to show off. There's not that many in the scheme of things. I do it because it's also better than looking at a blank wall for me. And I also do it, quite frankly, the main reason is in recent weeks or months, whenever it was, I think weeks, I had to rearrange the, the room because as I touched upon again in another vlog, that sofa bed, which was here that you used to look at 
albeit from more of a distance, the screen was further pushed back. Um, the sofa bed was useless because I couldn't reach the computer because I'm not bloody Inspector Gadget with my arms. I couldn't see the PlayStation 4, which was over there. So it was pointless. Other than a sofa bed for when we had friends and family to stay over, it was absolutely a waste of time. So that sofa bed went into the middle bedroom where now it's used properly. And, but it meant, of course, that this back wall was empty. So I had to put something there. So uh, I know a few vids back, you had the Amiga 600s on display, like on display. I do use the thing, uh, but you could see it on camera. Um, but I ha again, I played around with the furniture as I always do. I should have been an interior designer. I'm always bloody moving things about. It will change again in the, in the, uh, the coming weeks. But for now, I had to put something there. And yes, yeah, so the music's there. But in terms of, is it, a, is it a gaming cliche when you see all the games behind people? I guess it is a cliche. Uh, a lot of people do it. Some people will do it for the right intentions, i.e. they're really proud genuinely of what they've got and it's their hobby and their interest and they're just sharing it with people. I'm sure, law of averages, there's some people who do it to show off. Uh, and you know what? I don't really mind. I don't, it doesn't bother me. Let people do what they want to do. But yeah, I think you can always tell when you're watching someone's vid, you know, are they a collector? Are they really into what they're talking about? Are they just doing it for views? Um, again, each to their own. It doesn't really bother me. It would have bothered me years ago on YouTube, four, five, six years ago. Um, but now I just, people can do what they want. I just don't really care. But yeah, I guess it is a bit of a cliche, isn't it? Um, in terms of clickbait, rant, drama type of vids, I think that here's the thing. It's a different generation. Most people who do those kind of vids are young and it's fashionable, it's trendy. And a lot of people use YouTube now as a business, don't they? So they want to they wanna get clicks, they want to get money. And definitely needed a drink now. I can feel my voice kind of going, even though it was mid-sentence. So yeah, people want to make those vids and because they need the views, they need the money, they need the subscribers, they want to be popular. It's just the way it is. Uh, I don't tend to watch those kind of vids, to be honest. Uh, but every now and again, I will, just for a laugh. Uh, but I think it's a different demographic to me. Most people who do those kind of clickbait, channel, uh, clickbait channels, I'm not subscribed to. And I think most people who do that probably aren't subscribed or watch my kind of vids either. So it's just, yeah, we're, we're a different kind of people, I think. Um, but how do I feel about it? Um, yeah, um, I'm not really, it, it doesn't really bother me. Well, let people do what they want to do. Question number five. John Hancock did a video called Are There Too Many YouTubers? in which he claims there are too many gaming channels. You may want to watch it. Anyway, do you feel there are too many gaming channels on YouTube? Yeah, funnily you mentioned that, Dylan. I did actually watch it, but it was a couple of weeks ago. There's a channel I'm subscribed to and have been for years and years called uh, TG Apuleius, or is it Apuleius? You never know how to pronounce that. I think Apuleius or Apuleius was a philosopher. Probably wrong, but I think that's uh, who he was. And uh, so yeah, so he was doing a video about it. But before I watched his vid, in the description box, he'd put a link to this John Hancock guy's uh, vid. So I watched that. Then I watched uh, TG Apuleius's, or Apuleius, whatever. Uh, and so then I could hear both sides of the coin. So yeah, I'd never heard of this. Oh, sorry, that's a slight line. I had heard of John Hancock, but I, I'm not subscribed to those kind of big American channels. I, it never does anything for me. Um, 99% of the channels I'm subscribed to have very few subscribers in the scheme of things. Some may have crept into their thousands, but they're really just people like me. You know, people, we just put the camera on, we record, and it's just very basic. And, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just easy to watch. It's just easy to relate to. That's my kind of thing. Um, there's two exceptions that I can immediately think of. Um, three, actually. One is Dan Wood. There may be more, but three that just spring to mind. One is Dan Wood, a British guy, really into his Amiga, loads of subscribers. But um, yeah, I watched Dan's stuff for years and years and years. He's just a really chilled out guy. I don't really comment too much on his vids because he probably gets so many comments that he probably can't even keep up uh, to replying to them all. So interaction wise, I, I don't tend to, to do that. But I know in the past I have, and, and even in the past, Dan's commented on a few of my vids as well. So he's just a nice guy. So that's why I still stay, stay subscribed to him. And the other two are American channels. There's the Happy Console Gamer and Pete Daw. Now I don't really watch uh, too much of what they do these days, but the reason why I've stayed subscribed and watch every now and again is because if you go back about five or six years when they still had a lot of subscribers, but not that many compared to now, 
I remember reaching out to them like they made a video about something I think they were getting criticism and I sent them a direct message like a PM and I just said look mate you know I don't know why I felt the need to do it but I was like just ignore it just you know be yourself I'd like you watching your stuff I relate to it you're chilled out you're relaxed you know and they both replied to me and the replies that they sent to me were like five times as long as the one that I'd sent to them and he just said to me that yeah these guys are really chilled out they're very kind of on the same wave, uh, same wavelength as me, uh, as you probably, because we're all kind of similar kind of personalities on, on YouTube. If you're watching this video, we're probably similar kind of personalities anyway. And yeah, since then they've gained loads of subscribers and they may not have the time to reply to loads of messages. But that to me, when they sent those messages to me and uh, three or more times the length of the message I sent them, that kind of highlighted, yeah, these are the kind of people that I like. You know, they've not got their head up there, you know where. They're very much kind of grounded, and I, I kind of like that. So, but yeah, this John Hancock guy basically he made a video and he said, he posed a question, you know, uh, are there too many YouTubers? And his answer was yes, there are too many YouTubers. I did have a problem. I'm sure he's a lovely guy. I'm not going to get personal with him. But by the way, why does he call himself the immortal John Hancock? I'm pretty sure he's not immortal. I'm pretty sure he isn't. But he's going to look pretty silly one day uh, in the future, hopefully many years from now. Um, but immortal, I don't know why. I don't know if that's a pun on something, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it is, I've, I've, I've got no clue. But um, yeah, basically there's a couple of things I've got a problem with. One in particular, the, the way it came across was that he was quite um, jealous of the fact that other people are making a career. It's almost like people are taking views and money ultimately away from his channel. Uh, now he made a valid point in the sense that there's a lot of rubbish out there. Of course there is, but also it's very subjective. A lot of the things which he will consider rubbish are people that I like watching. He might consider this channel rubbish or your channel rubbish, but this is what I do is kind of the, the, the videos I like to watch. People just put making a vlog, making a pickup vid, doing a gameplay vid, being very personable and friendly and down to earth and lighthearted. I love that kind of stuff. I'm not into all the heavy editing, selling things to people, Patreon, if you've got it, no offence, don't feel guilty, each to their own, it's not for me. But I, I'm not into all that kind of stuff. And he very much is. He's got 60,000 subscribers, although he did have, I looked the other day, and it's down to 58 unless it's gone up. So losing 2,000 for that video he made, which I'm guessing is what happened, that's that's quite a hit. Um, he seems a nicest guy, but um, yeah, maybe he made an error doing that, I think. And he, he said something very telling in the vid. He, he said, you know, what's the point? I think he even actually said that. What's the point? All these companies contacting him to say, hey, can you do a review on this product? What's the point doing that if you've already sent it to a lot of other people and their video is up, um, up before his is? He's like, what's the point of that? And that sounded like, oh, that was a bit off. It was like he made it sound like it's all about him. Why are other people getting the attention, the subscribers, the money instead of him? It kind of, it was almost like a, a sense of self-entitlement that he feels he has. Maybe it's not his fault. Maybe it's because when you get a load of subscribers, uh, you start to feel really popular and you start to think you're bigger and better than what you are. Maybe there's an element of that. So it was a little bit distasteful, I think, really, when he started to say that. Um, it sounded really bad, really bad. It sounded like it was just about him, like he wants the views. He wants the, the money. Why are other people getting in in line before him? You know, he should be first in the pecking order. And so that came across bad. Um, so that's what I think of that, to be honest, Dylan. He, he shouldn't have, not so much he shouldn't have done the video. It's his channel, he can do what he wants. He should have, listen, it is, it's his opinion and fine. And if that's his opinion and if he believes it, then okay. But I think he phrased it wrong. Maybe I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Because I understood to a degree, there's a lot of channels out there, especially in this day and age, because people see it as a quick way to earn money. So there's loads of channels that are going up. People are going heavy with the clickbait, with the um, with the vids every single day, and this, that, and the other. And that's fine. That's fine, I guess. But it's very competitive. And I guess, as a result of it being very competitive and people wanting to earn money, then there's a lot of rubbish out there but like I say rubbish is subjective we all like different things I just I don't think he should have phrased it basically how he did uh, it, it made him look quite bad but but ultimately Dylan you've said do you feel there are too many channels 
No, I don't think there are. I think it's a great platform, YouTube, for people to make videos if they want, when they want, talk about what they want, and to forge great friendships, as I have done in eight years or so of making YouTube vids. And it's a real shame that it's so hard these days to get the subscribes, that it puts a lot of people off from making a channel. I'd say if you want to make a channel, just do it. It will be difficult, and you may get a stroke of luck and just take off, and it, it could be incredible. But bear in mind, it could be a struggle to get subs. Again, it's something I've talked about in recent vids, including my last one. It's harder than ever to get subscribers, but it's possible. It really is. So, um, yeah, just interact is what I'd say. Leave comments on people's vids regularly. Don't just do it once and think, oh, well, they didn't subscribe to me. You've got to regularly do it. I mentioned Cine Steve earlier on. I think he left two or three comments before I finally clicked on his channel and then thought, oh, you know, I recognise this guy's name. Let's click on his channel and see what he's doing. So, you know, don't get put off. Don't get downhearted. Um, downhearted, is that a word? I think it is. Maybe I've just invented it. If I did invent it, it's a good one. Um, I think downhearted is a word, isn't it? Anyway, won't dwell on that. So, yeah, just, just make a channel if you want. I don't think there's too many channels. I do somewhat see where he's coming from in terms of the quality um, because maybe people are making videos for the wrong intentions, i.e. money. But ultimately, um, it's a good thing that people are making vids. Next questions are from Jimmy M. Thank you, Jimmy, and thank you, Dylan, before that. What do you think of everyone cashing in on this Battle Royale mode popularised by PUBG and now Fortnite? Yeah, I mean, that's just frustrating, isn't it? And then Jimmy goes on. And as Call of Duty just announced their new game will have a Battle Royale mode and no campaign. And the newest Battlefield will have one added to it eventually as well. To be honest, Jimmy, I'm not really sure what Battle Royale mode is. Because from what I understand, isn't it just a situation where you put all these players into one map and then it's just like an elimination, last man standing. And if that is the case, has not been done for years with like hardcore team deathmatch in or hardcore free for all in Call of Duty? It's the same thing, isn't it? You've got a load of people and as soon as you're killed, you're eliminated until there's like a winner. Isn't that how it works? I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, but maybe the, the point of this is that it's on a bigger scale, a bigger map and uh, more people, maybe 100 people, 200, I don't know. Uh, listen, in one sense, it, it appeals to me to a degree, but not to the point where I'd want to play it all the time and in every new game that's released. But yeah, it seems to be like the latest thing. It's the in thing. It's fashionable. Every game has to have Battle Royale. Um, it seems to be like the selling mode, isn't it? Call of Duty doing it, as you say. Um, is it in Battlefield as well? Yeah, I, that, that'd be ridiculous if, if they all start doing it. But maybe it's what the kids want. Maybe it's the, it's what's going to sell them games. And if it is, they're a business. So yes, it's a little bit frustrating that all these games, all these publishers, they're all jumping on the bandwagon. Um, but if that's going to sell them games and earn them money, I guess they're going to do it. Um, like I say, I've not played PUBG. I've not played Fortnite. I know they're very popular. Um, I never say never to try in them. I may try them before the year's out. Uh, it's just not really my thing. Certainly not Fortnite doesn't look my thing. It's very cartoony. It's one of the reasons I didn't get into Overwatch. In fact, I've not so much not got into it. I've never even played it. It just looks, maybe it's not my thing. But you may be watching this thinking, Alex, Fortnite is amazing. Try it. I might try it. We'll see. It's just, it doesn't look like it's my kind of thing. So the next question is by Denna35. Now, I wasn't sure if this was a question intended for the brew or if it was intended for me just to answer in the comments section. But I'm going to do it anyway, because uh, it's an extra question and it makes me look super popular. Now, I'm only joking. I just did it because I'm answering questions. So what do you think of the classic 1996 album Fantastic Planet by Failure? And then uh, Denna35 goes on to say, brilliant album in his opinion. Um, it's funny you mention that because i totally forgotten about it, but years and years and years ago, I don't know who it was, someone recommended it to me and I played it and I thought it was all right. It kind of sounds, you put there in your comment, like grunge kind of space rock. And yeah, it is. It's very kind of Nirvana-esque with maybe a bit of sort of sound garden, a little bit of shoegazing in there, maybe a bit of the swerve, dr the swerve driver, swerve driver, the poses. I heard a bit of the poses in there. And, but yeah, someone recommended it years ago. I listened to it briefly. I hadn't actually heard of it before. So you said the classic album. It must have went over my head back in 1996. 
Uh, but again, that whole Britpop thing, I, I wasn't um, really listening to too much else. Also, Denna, if what is your name, Denna? Don't even know. Denna thirty five. Where are you in in the world? If you're in America, then I don't think that would would have been perceived as maybe a classic uh, album in the UK. It probably went onto the radar. I guess it depends what kind of genre you're into. Uh, but yeah, I listened to it just the other day actually. After you made the question, uh, after you, after you left the question, and yeah, it's decent. It's all right. It's kind of borderline. Uh, well, like you said, um, grunge, space rock, borderline power pop, maybe bubblegum pop, sort of. Not quite. It kind of just it's there on the edges of that. But yeah, I'd say the poses for me are a really good kind of comparison, and Nirvana maybe especially. Just for me anyway, nowhere near as good. But yeah, not too bad. That's that's my opinion of that. I just I would hesitate to call it a classic just because I hadn't heard of it um, until it was recommended to me a few years ago. Next question is from Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. What is your favourite PlayStation game, or favourite game, I should say, from each PlayStation console? And have you tried to play PS1 recently? I tried it, he tried it, and it's not aged well at all. Okay, so I've got a few props. I won't elaborate too much because the video has gone on for a long time. I'm going to have to kind of do a little bit of editing. Uh, don't worry, you wouldn't have missed too much. Just like editing the gaps, uh, of me talking nonsense and maybe repeating myself going on for too long uh, just to try and scale it back it's going to be another kind of hour and a half hopefully less but we'll see what can you do there's timestamps that's what the timestamps are there for so uh, yeah let's start with the PlayStation 1 again we'll go through them quite quickly these are in no particular order Soccer 97 absolutely love this um, basically I adored Olympic Soccer and this is the sequel it's really good PAL exclusive Olympic Soccer dealt funnily enough with the Olympics and Soccer 97 is club teams, with the emphasis, I think, maybe it's entirely, I can't remember, on the Premier League. I'm sure there may be some others as well, maybe some championship teams as well. Um, but it's a really good game. It's basically the same engine, with a few refinements. Totally unrealistic, but I really, really like it. Resident Evil, next up, an absolute classic game. There's, again, classic, the classic moment of when you're walking down the corridor and the dog bursts out the window. Everybody always mentions that, but I swear to God, maybe like yourself, when that first happened to me, I was playing with my friend, we nearly fell off our chairs. It was so frightening, it was ridiculous. Uh, next up is Destruction Derby. This one was sent to me by Craig Minx 36 Craig, still got your love letter that you sent to me from about five or six years ago. Um, yeah, this is an absolutely classic game. I absolutely love it. It was, I think, the first game that I saw in the magazines, and the first one that I looked at and thought, wow, that is the next generation of gaming. That is way better than 16-bit, so really good. And I think still quite playable, to be honest. Loaded, brilliant game. I really like this. I was playing this quite recently. The lighting effects are amazing. It still looks good. The soundtrack's really good. It's just a brilliant game. It reminds me of uh, Christmas 95 when I got my PlayStation. I got that and a few others and I absolutely adored it. But I guess the one game which, for me, is just synonymous with the PlayStation. If I had to pick one, it would be this. It's Ridge Racer, an absolutely amazing game. I still think it looks great. I'll touch upon that in a second, Aaron. Uh, I still think it plays well. Like, all right, it's dated a little bit in terms of playability and aesthetics, but I still think it does play and look good. And it's just amazing. Great memories of playing it on the arcade when I was at college. And I just absolutely love it. Now, specifically regarding to the fact that you don't think it's aged well at all, well, yeah, I agree in the sense that it hasn't graphically, because it, it went with that kind of 3D polygon look, didn't it? And it's aged big time. You look at PlayStation games now, and they flicker, uh, they're not complete. It's got, the, the, like I said, the polygon look that the Dreamcast had, that the Saturn had. It was very much of its time. It's a very 90s thing. But I still think it looks good. I really do. I can still... Here's the thing with me with PlayStation 1 games. Yes, usually you put it on and straight away you're hit by the graphics, for the most part. But after about, and this is just for me, after about maybe 10 or 15 minutes of playing the game, I forget that it looks quite ropey, and I really get into the game and I can appreciate it. So I absolutely love the PlayStation 1. Uh, I think it's a brilliant system, and I was playing it quite recently, playing those games and some others. I love it, it's just a brilliant system. But I do see where you're coming from, Aaron. Uh, I kind of agree and disagree. Uh, it depends how you want to tackle it. PlayStation 2, I've just picked out a couple. These are both PAL games, but when it comes to the PS2, I really don't care if it's PAL or NTSC. I don't buy that many. Uh, maybe in the future I will. But the first one I loved back in the day was Star Wars Battlefront 2. 
I put this on quite recently, bloody hell. I tell you what, Aaron, this has aged more than PlayStation 1 games for me. It just looked worse, but I loved it, um, you know, back when it came out. And then, of course, really, Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas. Vice City may even get the edge, to be honest, because of the 80s vibe. But I love this game too. Me and a friend of mine in particular, Sam, again, another one I mentioned quite a lot. Uh, we would just cane this game. We'd take it in turns, basically, um, until someone got caught by the police. And then it was the queue for the other person to, uh, to have their turn. And uh, it was just brilliant. A really good game and fantastic. In regards to the PlayStation 3, again, I've picked out three. And they're all the same, to a degree, same franchise. Uncharted. Uncharted, you know what's coming next, of course. Uncharted 2 and Uncharted 3, absolutely amazing games, um, yeah just brilliant, it, it took me ages to actually put the first one on and get into it, but when I did I absolutely loved it and they're, they're just absolutely amazing, if you've not played the Uncharted games you owe it upon yourself or owe it to yourself to do it. And then of course for the PlayStation 4 so far because well according to Pete, it's fantastic, we've got three more years left of this generation, uh, it's going to have to be PlayStation, uh, PlayStation 4. Um, Uncharted 4 on the PS4, there's the Steelbook Edition, which is just really, really good. But what gives it a good run for its money would be this one, God of War. really like this. Uh, finished the campaign mode, it went on and on and on and on. God knows how many hours. 30-odd, maybe. It's just brilliant that games are putting the time into single-player campaigns in an era where, as Jimmy said, you know, Battle Royale and multiplayer-only games uh, are kind of taking off and... I don't mind that for, for the audience that want that, but don't get rid of the single player campaigns and story modes, that, that would be terrible for gaming. And then last but not least, we've got a two part question for next time from Muzz247365, available any time of the day or night. Click your fingers, he arrives with a cape on his back like a superhero. What do you want? 247365, Muzz is ready. Do you have any fond memories of the World Cup? And question number two, how do you think England will get on this time? How do you think, mate? <laughs> Second round, knocked out on penalties. Fun memories of the World Cup. The first World Cup I remember would have been Mexico 86, but it's just snippets really, because I was young. It's bits and pieces. It's I vividly remember the Maradona goal, uh, the first one where he punched it in. I do remember the second one as well. I remember Gary Lineker pulling one back. I remember Gary Lineker missing an even easier chance to equalize, uh, like two minutes later. Um, I remember the Panini stickers from the time, certain players, just like I said, just snippets, flashes in my mind. I've seen it on the TV and in the magazines and stuff. But Italia 90, that would be the first one that I remember really vividly. Everything about it. Where sitting down where I was, watching certain games, watching the opening ceremony, watching the England games, watching everyone, quite frankly. The first World Cup that I truly remember. Now, the quality of football wasn't all that good. Not really. It was not the best World Cup for football. But in terms of memories, uh, in terms of nostalgia, uh, it's probably the best. I absolutely love it. Um, other World Cups, 1994. Um, I was doing my exams, or just finishing my school exams by the time that one was done, which didn't help because it was in America. So I had an exam the next day at 9 o'clock, or 8 o'clock in the morning, but I was up at 4 o'clock watching bloody like Bulgaria v Sweden, or something ridiculous like that. So <laughs> that was kind of daft. Um, but yes, yeah, so many memories, uh, Mills, it's ridiculous. But the early memories, 86, but particularly 1990. 1990 for me is just, well, oh, everything about it is just amazing. The best World Cup song as well, World in Motion by New Order. Absolutely amazing. Um, in terms of how uh, are England going to get on, yeah, uh, who knows, who knows. Um, I'm obviously not in the UK, so I don't know how it's been perceived. I don't know if people think this is going to be the year, like they usually do, or whether people have finally had enough and are just like, we've just got to get knocked out. Rubbish. Um, I don't think the squad's particularly good, but I do think there's a lot of good, talented young players. I think probably, maybe quarter-final, it would be a disaster if they don't make it out of the group stage. I know people say that, oh, going to get knocked out in the groups. It would be a disaster and unacceptable um, to get knocked out in the groups. It, you should get through a, a group of Costa Rica, Panama and Belgium. I know Belgium are good, um, but England should get out of a group. Let's not make any excuses for them with those teams in it. But to be honest, yeah, I don't think they're going to win it. You never know in a cup competition, but I'd probably say maybe second round, quarter final, and probably lose. I don't think they're going to get a beating from anyone. They're probably going to lose on penalties in the second round of the quarter final. But it would be nice if they were to win it. 
So anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you've got any questions for next time, please leave them in the description box. And until then, see you later.